get into this series that we've kicked off that we call Guardrails. This is uh, content that we kind of... Uh, I would say stole, but we got permission to, to use from a church that did a, this series with the same exact name. Uh, they even made the video for us, and so that's pretty cool. Uh, we just, we thought it was so simple and so smart and so helpful that we thought we want to bring this to our church. So we've been going through it, and the whole idea is that, like in the video, a, a guardrail is someplace for a reason. You don't want to go off the road there. You don't want to go across traffic or over the edge or whatever it is, and uh, kind of the big idea for the series is the highway is not the only place that we need guardrails. So each week we've just been like looking at a different area of our life and asking the question, what would it look like to have wise protection in my life in that area. And, and I'm trying not to tell you what to do or how to live or what decisions to make. We've tried to just uh, take this series as an uh, invitation to receive wisdom that you would even take time to talk with your spouse or your friends or your family to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to say, hey, what is it in this area? So, um, you know, we've talked about uh, like the impact that friends have in our life and what do we do knowing, knowing what we can know about that and being wise. And so each week we're looking at that and um, today we're going to be talking about about financial guardrails, okay? What does it look like to be wise with how we use, spend, save, give, you know, uh, steward our financial resources? Uh, so last week, if you were here, uh, we talked about sex, and that might have been a little awkward for you. This week, we're talking about money, which might even be more awkward for you. It's kind of a bummer because people seem to think that church is against sex and church just wants my money, right? Um, that's what you might be thinking right now. Of course he's talking about money because that's what pastors do. And uh, I think this is a, this is a shame. But I know it's true. I think this is sad, and, uh, and, and maybe for some churches that you, would, you could define them, but this is not our heart. Um, we're not against sex. Basically, if you missed last week, you can go watch on YouTube, but we believe God invented it. He gave it to humans as a good gift, um, but we think we should be wise with how we use it. We should take the uh, instructions from the creator, and so we kind of got into that. And this week, we're going to talk about money and finances, but not because I want to beg you. I'm not trying to hit you up for money. You know, we're meeting in a school, and hopefully, we, you know, maybe someday we'll have a building. If you give me enough money, that's not the point. We believe that it's a real heart issue. What we want to look at is some words that Jesus taught to people 2,000 years ago that are still true and I, not, not just impactful, but helpful in our lives today. And so we're going to look at what would it look like um, to have wise protection guardrails in this area of our life. The reason we got to talk about this is the problem is well, I think most people make their most regrets in the area of one of these two things, right? Maybe that's you, but most people that you know, their biggest regrets are probably having to do with sex or money. The truth, sadly, and surveys continue to show this, is most uh, marriages fight and end the most over sex and money. These are the two biggest causes for stress in marriages and even divorce. And so it's like, man, we've got to talk about these kind of topics. You know, Jesus talked about this kind of stuff a lot. The New Testament is full of Paul's letters and other early church leaders talking about this kind of stuff. Um, and I think maybe true that maybe the most ignored of all Jesus' teaching come in our, in our lives in the area of sex and money. That our culture is so counter what Jesus would tell us and we get sucked into that. That if we don't have guardrails to protect us, we'll go in a ditch somewhere in our life. And it might be in the area of sex or money. Most likely in our culture, that's where we're going to get sucked into the easiest. And what seems fun and what seems normal is actually not healthy. So that's why we have to talk about these kinds of things. Okay, so if you brought a Bible and you want to follow along, I'll put it on the screen too for the cheaters, but it's awesome for you to bring a Bible, even if it's digital, and be able to see it with your own eyes and, and be able to maybe even read it later today or later on this week. Um, we believe as a church that God puts his Holy Spirit in every believer's heart, and he actually helps us understand the Bible. So each week we do our best to open up the Bible and try to hear from God and try to say, what does this mean to me? But I don't want you just to take my word for it. You know, scripture, the New Testament says we should test all things, which means you can read the Bible on your own. So that's why I say bring a Bible. We'll put it on the screen uh, for convenience, but it's so good for you to learn how to, you know, maneuver in your own Bible and read it with your own eyes, read it during the week, and you can hear from God on your own. We really get excited about that. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, which is kind of uh, in the middle of or part of a very famous speech or sermon that Jesus gave about 2,000 years ago. And we kind of in church world call it the Sermon on the Mount because he was out on the this hillside or this mountain, and he gave this 
big sermon. He hit all kinds of topics and a lot of touchy topics, you know, like uh, divorce and sex and money and, and things and prayer that you just don't really talk about with people, but Jesus went there. And um, so he talked about it a lot. One of the things that he said, not in this sermon, but I love, is that Jesus said, you know, why he came. And he said, I have come that my followers may have life more abundant. Life to the full, right? The New Living Translation says a rich and satisfying life. That's John 10, 10. It's this, Jesus is saying, this is why I came, to show you how to live, to show you how to have a relationship with God, to, to bring you a better way, to give you a better life. And we really believe that. And so we want to take our cues from him on how to pray, on, on how to give, on how to manage our money, on how to manage our relationships in all areas of life, because we believe that he wants best for us. With sex, we believe that God's views on sex are better than what we see in media and on social media or even in our friend's life. We believe that God is not just an old fuddy-duddy who doesn't want us to have fun. We just believe that he knows better and he actually wants best for us with money. We don't believe that God wants our money. We don't believe that God needs our money. Now, he chooses to use our gifts in, in powerful ways in our community, in our church, in our ministries around the world, you know, uh, or even just your generosity, you know, outside of this, this congregation. Uh, he chooses to allow us to be used that way, but he doesn't need your gift or mine. He can accomplish his purposes without you or I. He, he's not up there, you know, hoping that like a new deposit gets put into his account. That's not what he needs. But what he wants is something for you, not from you. He knows that when we surrender this area of our life, he will get a hold of our hearts in new ways and in powerful ways that will be such a blessing to us. So when we talk about money, it's not what God wants from us. It's what God wants for us. And what I love about what we're going to see in Matthew chapter 6, what Jesus says, he doesn't just talk about like smart, wise things. You know, he could talk about like, be careful getting into debt. You don't want to get over your head. It's really stressful. That'd be good advice. You know, he could talk about how to spend wisely and, you know, how to create a budget. And like, there's all kinds of good advice that he could give and it wouldn't be a waste of breath and you could take classes or even do financial peace with our church. We offer this class. But what he does in Matthew 6 is he gets to the root of the issue. He doesn't want to just help you manage money or have a, a good view on it. He wants to look at our heart. And the way I think about it is this. I, uh, I'm pretty blind. I mean, I'm not legally blind. I can, I can drive around, and I, I probably won't run over you. I can't read road signs, but I, won't, I do see pedestrians. Okay, anyways, I have glasses. I choose not to wear them. And so far, the state of Illinois has not told me that I have to wear them. So um, anyways, once in a while, I'll put my glasses on, and uh, it never fails. If I have my glasses on and I look in the mirror, I usually say, wow. I need to shave, right? Because I don't like to shave and I tell myself that I'm still like a teenage boy who just gets peach fuzz. And the, the bottom line is I don't realize how blind I am. And my wife's like, yeah, you need to shave for like two days, dude. But I'm so blind, I look cleanly shaven to myself until I put my glasses on and I see myself for how I really am. Like it's like all of a sudden I can see clearly and I see a problem that I didn't see before. Jesus takes us to the root of the issue. He, he wants us to see clearly the heart of the issue. He's not just going to talk about what we can or can't do with money. Uh, he's not just going to try and give us good advice about how to save or how to spend or how to be generous. He wants to really get a hard look that might be uncomfortable, but is so helpful. So Matthew chapter six, and we're going to pick up in verse 24. So he kind of hits a bunch of topics in this speech and this sermon. And um, in verse 24, he says this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other, okay? Now, it's interesting when he says, no one can serve two masters. When you and I read this in 2021 as Americans, the best thing we think of is like your boss, right? He, he's over you. You report to him. He can fire you or give you a raise. But Jesus is talking about something way bigger than a boss, okay? When he says master, uh, in their culture, and even the specific word that he chose that we translate master, is the idea of ownership and possession, that it's not just that you can't have two bosses, it's that you can't be owned by two things, okay? You will, your heart will only be able to go in one direction. Who are you going to give your heart to? Who are you gonna give yourself to? That we have kind of a, a choice to play in this and that we don't realize we can make it one way or the other. So he says, no one can serve two masters. 
To which we say, well, nobody owns me, right? Like, I'm my own man. I live in land of the free, home of the brave, and I make my own money, and I got my own house, and, and the American culture, you know, I'm my own person. Nobody owns me. But we're going to see that really, even on accident, we give ourselves, we give our heart some, to something, to someone, to some area, and it can be so good for us, or it can be so bad for us, okay? And so he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll... Uh, be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then he says, this is really interesting. You cannot serve both God and, and it, uh, maybe you've read these verses before. This is a pretty famous speech. So, you know, we, it's been quoted. We've taught on it at our church before. But if you never heard this, I would expect him to say, you can't serve both God and Satan, right? You know, like black and white, good versus evil, like God versus the devil. Like this is what you, you know, you can't worship to entities. You can't give yourself and be owned completely by God and Satan, but that's not what he says. It's so interesting what he says. You cannot serve both God and money. He, he gets to the heart of the issue that deep inside of us, it's more than just, what did I do with my check this month? What did I do with my money this week? How did I spend it? You know, it's that something about money. Now, money is not evil by itself. He's not saying that we shouldn't have money, that we shouldn't make money, that we shouldn't leverage our money. He's not saying that money is bad. In fact, one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible, later on in the New Testament, you'll hear people say that um, money is evil. You know, money is a root of all kinds of evil. But that's not what the verse says. It actually says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil because our hearts get entangled by it. And basically what God, Jesus is teaching us is that money is probably the primary competitor for your heart. And that if we're not careful, even on accident, our, our whole being, our, our very self is just consumed with consuming. That what we make, how much we make, if I can make more, how much I owe, what I have, what I don't have. Materialism. You might be a wanter and a spender. You might be a saver and a hoarder. But either way, we can focus on what we have, what we don't have, how to keep what we have, how to take advantage of what we have. And we can put our heart into our, into our stuff. In fact, when he uses this word money, it talks about uh, possessions and, and really just your stuff. It's not literally the dollars in your pocket. It's, it's what you own. It's what you manage. It's what you have possession over. And he says, if you're not careful, you can worship your stuff. And if you do, you're not going to worship me. You're going to miss out on giving God your heart. It's interesting that he doesn't say you can't serve God and Satan. You know, that's too blatant. That's too obvious. It, it's, it's deeper than that. And we often miss it. But money is the chief competitor for our hearts. It gets in the way. And so the primary issue with Jesus is not your money. It's not how much money you have or what you bought last week or what your bank account says. It's mastery. That if our money has control over our hearts, that if our money is tugging our hearts away from him, we are, we're mastered by our money instead of being people who master what we have. So really, I think the question that Jesus is trying to get us to say is, do we have money or does our money have us. And you might, you might be old enough to feel like, I've seen that work both ways in my life. I've seen that work both ways in other people's life, right? That God brings us blessings, whether it's jobs or inheritance or whatever, that we have, you know, finances and resources to manage. And, and that can be this great, good thing, but it can be this consuming grind where we're stressed about it and we're, we're materialistic about it. And we can either be people that have money or we can be people who are had by money. Does money own you or do you own it? Does money possess you or do you possess it? Jesus knows that the number one thing in our heart that gets in our way of worshiping God and following him is our money. Not because money's bad, but money and what money promises and how it takes our focus and it just takes our whole being, uh, it just interferes. It gets in our way. And it's interesting because this was true for them 2,000 years ago on the mountain. He's talking to these people, you know, and they had so much less than us. They didn't have air conditioning. I mean, whatever we have that they don't have, I'll take air conditioning, right? Uh, if I don't have a flush toilet, that's okay. Give me air conditioning. That's like the one luxury I would choose. I don't know what yours would be, but we have it so good. We have so much more than they have. We, you know, we can keep food in a refrigerator. Like, we have so much less to worry about than what they had. That's why when they would go to the mountain and he'd be preaching, eventually he'd feed them because they didn't have like an igloo cooler to whip out a sandwich. They, they probably didn't have food to pack to begin with. They, they, they didn't live like we live. And it's so true for them, it might be even more true for us 2,000 years later, especially in our American culture, that our heart 
our very self can be so materialistic, so consumed by our possessions, what we have, what we don't have, that it can ruin our relationship and our worship of Jesus. That's the issue. It's not just money. It's the root of the issue. And I would put a word to it would be greed. Now, I wasn't smart enough to make this up, but I was smart enough to write it down. I thought it was really smart. Here's a great definition that you'll remember for greed. Greed is just the assumption that everything I have is for my consumption, right? This is greedy the American way. If you make $100, if you make a million dollars, that's your $100 or your million dollars. You can do whatever you want with it. You earned it. It's yours. You can spend it. You can gamble it. You can waste it. You can give it. You can put it away for retirement. It's yours. Do with whatever you want. You earned it. And really, we don't like to see it this way, and we don't feel greedy. It's easier to see greed in somebody else. I can look at you and say, you're greedy. You can look at me and say, I'm greedy, but we, neither one of us will look in the mirror and say, myself is greedy. It's not something, you know, everybody else is more greedy than me, so I don't see it in myself. But really, if we just assume that everything that comes our way, every dollar we make, every direct deposit, every inheritance, every gift, everything that comes into my possession, every resource I have, everything that goes into my retirement fund, if, if I, you know, every paycheck, every bonus, if I just say, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, and I get to do with whatever I want, I'm assuming that it's all mine to consume. The assumption that it's for my consumption is a great definition of greed. But when we live this way, we miss out. When we live this way, you really, you're living as if there is no God. So I know a lot of you would call yourself a Christian. Praise God for that. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you follow some other religion. Either way, whatever religion you would, you know, whatever God or sets of gods you follow, when we live this way, it's like we don't believe there's really a God. We really don't believe there's an afterlife, that I'm going to just use what I have for myself, for now, for my retirement, for my kids' future. You know, it's all for my consumption, for me to plan, for me to spend, for me to use, it, as if there is no afterlife, as if there is no God to give an account to, as if, like, could it be that what we have comes from God? That he's blessed us with the, you know, upbringing that we have, the education that we have, the, the, the job that we have, the employment, the opportunity to have whatever we have, that we could praise him and say, this is actually a gift from God. And maybe, just maybe, could it be that everything we have could be used by God? That he could use us to bless other people, to, to accomplish his will, that it wouldn't just be all for our own consumption. But here's the other thing. We live like this, until something goes wrong, right? We borrowed too much money, we quit our job, or you know, something that we did, or maybe something that somebody cheated us. It wasn't even something that we did, but somehow we, were, we got the raw end of a deal, or we got fired, or it wasn't even somebody that cheated us. It was medical bills, or you know, some unforeseen expense that popped up, you know, car repairs, and all of a sudden, I'm in financial trouble. And as much as I have whatever I have to take care of myself, I can't take care of myself. So even people who don't believe in God and don't want anything to do with God, all of a sudden, we all become prayers, right? If you've never been a prayer before when financial trouble comes, now you're a prayer. And what do we say? Help, God. You know, if there is a God, you know, or even if I, I know there's a God, but I haven't talked to him in a while, we start to ask for his help. And really, when you start to pray about your finances because you're in such financial trouble, you realize that you don't have it in your own self to fix all your financial worries. What you're really saying is, dear God, I would finally like to invite you into my finances, Maybe you've been there. I've been there. Like, Holy cow, God, I need your help. <laughs> I can't fix this. I can't afford that. I can't pay for that. I can't pay that back. You know, whatever, wherever you're at when you have that prayer, now, even if it's been a long time, that's where you start to pray. You know, I think almost everybody is a prayer if they're either uh, having, you know, health issues or financial issues, we all eventually start to pray to somebody out there, even if we weren't sure they existed, almost like a last resort. You may be asking God for a job or for a raise, for you know a deal to come through, for mercy from somebody, from a loaner, maybe for a new loan or whatever it is. Uh, you're asking God to intervene, to help, to show up, to, you know, you might be rubbing two pennies or a lucky rabbit's foot or, you know, whatever it takes because you realize that you need some cosmic super supernatural kind of help. And when you do, you're basically admitting that, I guess I chose the wrong master. I've given myself to my stuff. I've chased after money as my God, and it's not working. It's not fulfilling me, and I am not the master of it. And so you turn to God. So here's, here's what I would say. If you think that you would invite God into your finances someday when things got bad enough, or maybe you have, why wouldn't you just invite God into your finances in the first place? That you can sit here today and be like, you know what? Could it be that what I have 
It wasn't because I'm so smart, but maybe God made me smart. It wasn't because, you know, I worked so hard. Maybe it's the work ethic that God instilled in me. You know, like, yes, I've played a role, but God has blessed me to this employment. God has brought me what I have. That Could it be what I have is from God? And maybe, just maybe, what I have could be used for God. And that we would say, I invite you into my finances now. I want to honor you with my finances in the first place. I want to start there and not get there because I'm so desperate. Why don't we just go ahead and invite him now? And why not even try to set that up as a guardrail to protect ourselves from getting sucked into this materialistic, consuming culture that can really destroy us because we're just left unsatisfied no matter how much we make, no matter what we own. There's been surveys done. People say how much is enough money and they've had people check off how much money they make and it's the same answer for all the different classes of, you know, whatever you make. That people that make a little bit of money, they look, they don't say, oh, I wish I had millions of dollars. They just want a little bit more. People that make hundreds of thousands, they don't wish they had billions of dollars. They just want a little bit more. The, the answer for how much is enough is always a little bit more. Even people that you think are rich, they think they need a little bit more. And people that are dirt poor, they don't want what you make. They just want a little bit more. That's just the human nature that we will not be satisfied by our stuff or by how much we make. And Jesus says, don't chase that. Don't make that your master. Don't give your life and your heart to that. I have better plans for you. So what if we could put guardrails to fight greed, to, to go against greed? Here's how I would say it. The way to fight greed is to be grateful for what God provides and to be generous with what God provides. To be grateful for what God gives. That we say, God, thank you for what you've given me. You know, maybe I wish I had a raise. Maybe I wish I had graduated with that degree and gotten that job. You know, maybe I wish I had a boat. Maybe I wish I had whatever, but I have this. Whatever I have, I can say thank you for this, and then I can be generous. Because what we say is, if I had a little bit more, then I would be more generous. Then I would offer to pick up the check at dinner. Then I would give more money at church. Then I would be more generous with whatever kind, you know, I would go to the banquet. I would do the, you know, the, where you sign like anonymously to do the thing and then you give money to charities. Like I would be more generous if I had, but what if we just said, God, thank you for whatever I have. This is what you've provided and I want to be grateful. When we choose to be grateful, we fight against greed. When we choose to be generous, some of my personal heroes are people who are generous. And what I love is they didn't wait till they had a ton of money to be generous. They made that their habit. Whether they had a little or they had a lot, they wanted to be generous and they were generous people, generous hearts. You know, both of these are like the opposite of greed. Being grateful is the opposite of being greedy. But you could also say that being generous is the opposite of being greedy. I want to pick on my, my one son, Everett, because we pray before meals as a family and just, we kind of all take turns. And Everett always has the most awesome prayers. They're super short, they're super simple, but they're super grateful. He'll say thank you for this food. And then usually he'll just say thank you for whatever else happened that day. And he means it. The other day, because school just started, he was praying and he said, thank you that we got to go to school today. And I was like, wow. When I was your age, I'd be like, God, I wish I didn't have to go to school today, right? You know what I mean? Like, I, hate, I, I actually told people I was allergic to school, and then I hated it. And so, I was, I, and he does that all the time. Thank you that we got to, you know, go to grandma's, or that we got to play outside, like the simplest things. He is really good at just seeing what God's given to him that day or that week, and he's just grateful. And the more you can be grateful, the less you will be greedy. And the more we can decide to be generous with whatever we have from God, the less we will be greedy. Greedy. So, real quick, before you think I'm just like the next pastor begging for your money, uh, I, I'm not. I, I'm not asking you to like make a second or third donation on your way out. I, I'm not trying to hit you up or make you feel guilty. Uh, I, I really believe that when Jesus taught this to people, he was trying to teach them something that was good for them. And I really believe, and a lot of you would agree and have experienced that when we start to live this way and become less greedy, we, we get more of God in our life and more joy along with it. And, um, so if, if you think, you know, I'm just the next pastor hitting you up for cash. Uh, so with my kids, we've tried to, to teach this. We, we try to pray, thank you for what we have. We trust you for being our provider. We, we know that everything we have comes from you, you know. And then they don't make a lot of money because I'm too cheap to give them an allowance. But like when they get cash, when they've earned something, you know, we, we say, hey, now what you're supposed to do is, is give some of that back, right? Be, before you blow it all, before you spend it all, before you even throw it all in your piggy bank, you should give some of that back. You should learn to be generous with that. Now, why would I tell them that they need to give back? 
back and specifically to the church? Is it because, you know, if they made 10 bucks and they put one in the offering, because I know that someday we're gonna try to build a building and the church needs their money? No, that's not why I teach my kids to give. It's because I know that as they grow up, money will probably be one of the biggest competitors for their heart, and I don't want money to win. And I don't want money to win for your hearts either. And your heavenly father doesn't want money to win the battle for your heart. So Jesus taught this, and he says, we fight greed, and we need to be grateful and generous from God and for God for what he provides. Um, This is how we fight greed. So I would say it uh, like this. The world leads us to be mastered by money. This is how most people that you know live, whether they admit it or not. They live and then give. And I put maybe in there. Because some people just live, and they never give. They don't give to people. They're not generous in any way. I'm not just talking about in church, uh, but especially with what we feel as Christians, we're called to be generous and, and give back to God what he's provided for us. Most people, I would say, are mastered by their money, whether they realize it or not, because they live first, and then they give. I believe what Jesus is teaching us, and what the New Testament and all of Scripture constantly teaches, is that if we want to be masters of money, we give before we live. Now, how much you give, how often you give, that's for you to think about, pray about, invite the Holy Spirit, talk with your spouse or your friends or whatever, you know, and uh, we believe that even the New Testament says we should decide in advance, that we should be cheerful, purposeful givers, not just like guilty, oh, here comes the plate, I better, you know, God wants us to be purposeful about it and cheerful, that we've decided I'm going to give this much or I'm going to give this percentage, but the idea is that we give first and then we live. Now how you live, you know, maybe you save a lot, maybe you save a little, I don't know what you spend your money on, you know, I think we can make wise purchases, we could, we could be God honoring with what we use our money for, but if we get one thing right, Jesus would say, and he taught, and the New Testament teaches that when we give first, we practice being generous right off the top, it will change our view of money. We will be fighting greed if we give before we live. Now I want to look Uh, back at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. In the same sermon, just a couple of sentences later, he says this, no one, or he said this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one or despise the other. Sounds like he's talking about God versus Satan, but he's actually talking about your heart with, between God or money, okay? You cannot serve both God and money. Then a couple of verses later, here's what he says. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Now, we worry about this, right? Like, I have lots of clothes, but we all look at the clothes like, oh, I don't know what to wear today. I don't, for me, it's like, I don't know what matches. I, I really don't know what I'm allowed to wear out of the house. For you guys, you might be like, I don't know. I, I don't know what I wore last week to work. You know, I had one friend, uh, he had a job where he had to wear a suit and tie every day to work, and uh, he didn't like picking out clothes. So he actually he created an algorithm that would match his shirts and ties for him. And he somehow he like math wizarded it out so he would never accidentally wear the same shirt with the same tie for like two years. And because he didn't want to be like the guy that wore the same clothes. I, we all worry about what we're going to wear and what we looks good. Maybe you, you've known someone that opens a closet like, I got nothing to wear, right? Now, back then they literally had nothing to wear. Clothes and food was very expensive, you know? They didn't have Old Navy down the street. They didn't have refrigeration and, you know, Super Walmart on the corner. And so same as today, we might look a little different, but we worry about these kinds of things. Don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you wear. See, Jesus knows that we'll be tempted to worry about our stuff, even the most simple, mundane things, and that we'll be jealous and, and greedy, uh, what we have, what we don't have, what we get, when we'll get it, where it'll come from, how much of it there'll be. Um, in the next verse, he says, don't worry about what you have, for the pagans run after these things. Okay, the, the pagans is like a generic word for people that don't follow God. They might worship another God or usually in their time another set of gods and they basically had no hope. The gods could be happy, the gods could be mad, the gods could bless you, the, you know, they could be fickle, we don't really trust these gods, you know, and, and so they have no hope. He's like, this is how the pagans live, but we have a better hope. We serve the one true God. And he sent Jesus for us. We have eternal hope and we have a better promise. And so he says, the pagans run after these things. You you can do better than that. And he says, and your heaven, this, this part's awesome. If you're a Christian, this part's amazing. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. You don't know what you're gonna eat next week. 
but God knows that you need to eat next week. You don't know what your next job's gonna be when this one runs out, but God knows. God, he knows what you need before you need it, before you ask, and that just makes me feel so much better. I don't serve a God who's waiting for me to beg him for help. He's aware of my needs before I'm aware, and he's promised to be a good God and a loving God. Now, he doesn't promise to make me rich and comfortable in all ways at all times to give me whatever I want, but he does promise to provide. And so he says, we don't need to worry if we can trust God. Do you really believe that God knows what you need? When you know that he knows and you believe that, then you don't need to worry about what you have, what you don't have, where it's coming from, when it's gonna come. That will help you so much. And then the next verse, he says this, really famous verse. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well, okay? He says, but instead of worrying about what I'll eat, about whatever, about everything else in life, instead of worrying, instead of consuming, instead of hoarding, instead of being focused on our stuff, seek first his kingdom. Turn your heart first. That's why I say give before live. Put your money where your mouth is. Put, in fact, I would say put your money where you want your heart to be. Because when we give first, our heart goes with it. God gets more of our heart. And so uh, instead of worrying about our stuff, we, we give back right at the top. We reprioritize, we rearrange our finances around this idea. Uh, instead of what's normal, we do this on purpose. We do this first. He says, seek first his kingdom. And God's kingdom is constantly about other people. God never came and said, you know, look out for yourself, take care of yourselves, get what you can for your family. He always talked about being a blessing to other people. And that was the whole reason that he came. He came to be a blessing to other people, okay? Um, I'll just put this on the, on the screen real quick, but in, in Mark chapter 10, you can flip there if you want to, but in Mark chapter 10, there's this one scene, and it actually happens several times. It's amazing. If you read through the Gospels over and over, his disciples like start arguing about which one of them is the best, or which one of them is the most important, or which one of them gets to sit next to the throne in heaven. And this one time in Mark 10, two of them ask God for like special preferences, you know, in the future kingdom, and, 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 and the rest of them don't get mad because they were so rude to ask. They get mad, I think, because like they should have thought to ask first. Like, dang it, they just called dibs on the best seat in heaven, right? And so they're, and they're arguing, they're mad at each other. And so Jesus stops, and this is what he says. In Mark chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus called them together, and he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. He's saying, you guys know how it goes in this world. Whoever is in charge is totally in charge. What they say goes, and they rule with a heavy fist, and everyone has to follow whether they like it or not. To which his disciples are probably thinking, yeah, that's why we keep asking to be super important in your kingdom, because we know how it works. You always want to be on top. You always want to be in control. That's the seat that you want at the table. And he says, not so with you. He looks at his disciples. He would look at you and I and say, stop worrying about what you have, how important you are, how much you have. It's not about your leadership, your command, your seat at the table, your place in life. Not so with you. You don't lord your authority. It's not how it works in my father's kingdom. That's what he's saying. Not in my father's kingdom. He says this, instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must become slave of all. His kingdom is so upside down that he says, everything about my kingdom is about other people first and my kingdom before yourself. And when you get it right, you actually receive incredible blessing. But when we get it wrong, we don't even realize what we're missing out. And then he says, this next, this next sentence is this most amazing thing that he says. He says, for even the son of man, he's talking about himself, even the son of man did not come to serve, but to, uh, did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he says, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's like, guys, I didn't even come like that. I know that's how the, you know, your bosses at work and then the, the, you know, the government authority, that, I know that's how it works in the world. That's not how it works in my father's kingdom. My father's kingdom is an other's first kingdom. It's about who you can bless, how God can work through you, you know, through your smile, through your finances, through every part of your life, your relationships. It's about being others first. I didn't even come to be served and I'm Jesus. In fact, I came to give generously my life as a ransom for all of your sin. That's why we celebrate communion this morning. You want to be like Jesus? Give before you live. He said, first, seek my kingdom. Now that, 
That has implications, I think, in all areas of our life. That we would surrender our relationships, like we were talking about, our thought life, you know, what we do with our time. But I also think it has implications on our finances. What does it look like to seek God first with our wallets? I think it means to give before we live. I don't want to tell you what to give, how much to give. I don't care if you give somewhere else. Give to a different church. I, 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 I don't want it to be about our church. Yeah, we're trying to you know, accomplish this or meet these goals or, or pay our bills. I really want it to be between you and God for your heart's good. Now, I know that a lot of you are really generous. In fact, I would say if you're new, you're probably sitting next to some of the most generous people in Grundy County. And it's not because they're all so wealthy. It's because they've purposed in their heart to give before they live and live on the rest, and trust God to bless them with the rest. And they want to be generous people and fight against greed because when we do, God gets a hold of our heart in the most incredible ways, and if you've done it, you know that it's worth it. No one ever comes back, at least not to me. I haven't heard anybody say, I'm so regretful of what I gave. I'm so regretful that I chose to be generous with that person that I gave to church. I wish I could have bought a pizza with that money, or, or you know, like, there's so many things that we could do with our money. I've never heard, maybe you have, and you can tell me, but I haven't heard anyone say, I regret being generous. Because I believe that we get so blessed through that and God gets a hold of our heart. So we give before we live. Now, can you imagine if Christians, just not not even the rest of the world, just Christians, if we actually did this well? Can you imagine if Christians were known in our community as generous people? Not just because like, oh, we give a lot to church, but like they just know they have a generous lifestyle. They are constantly looking for ways to serve people and bless people and be generous with their their money, with their resources, with their stuff, with their time, that they're just generous. Can you imagine the the, uh, reputation that we would build if Christians were just known as the most generous people? And that people would say, wow, I can't believe you decided to give before you live. Most of our world lives on more than 100% of what they make, right? Like I make $10, I actually spent 15, right? Like most people live on more than 100%. As Christians, we try to say, I'm going to live on less than 100%. I'm going to live on what's left after I've decided to give first. Can you imagine the reputation we would build? I mean, that would get people's attention. But more than that, God would get our hearts. He would, he would meet you. We would trust him more. We would receive more joy in following him. He said, where your treasure is, your heart will naturally go with it. So we give first because that's how we want to be. You practice giving generously because of who you want to be, knowing that God will meet you there and bless you there. If we got this right, it could change. I would say it would change the world. I'll close with just a couple questions. As you look at your life, would you say you're becoming more greedy or more godly? Because Jesus says it's not that money is, 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 is evil, but what money can do if we make it our God is evil. And so we can basically become more greedy or we can become more godly. Sometimes that's just a good way to look at which direction we're heading. How can you be more grateful for what God provides? How can you be more generous with what God provides? And the last question, what will it look like for you to fight greed and give before you live. Maybe you've never tried that. Maybe you want to start small. I don't want to tell you what to do about it, but I would, I would love to lead you in a moment where we just pray and we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us, not as a guilt trip, but as a way to say, God, I want to honor you. I want to make you my master and not be mastered by anything else. And especially for Americans, this is an area that I think we miss out so much. So would you pray with me? God, uh, Thank you for the wisdom that Jesus taught 2,000 years ago. It's crazy to me how true it was for them and how true it is today for us. But God, this is your truth, your eternal truth. And I pray that it would resonate in our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just give us wisdom. Father, you've, you've promised to give us wisdom when we ask. So we come asking that you would speak to us, that you would give us wisdom. Speak to us right now in our own heart. Maybe use someone that we know. Bring us wise counsel. Get our attention however we want to invite you to get our attention. If you would have us give before we live, I pray that you'd make that clear in our hearts. God, I pray for anyone who's like, yeah, I, I, I should do that. I want to try that. I pray that you give them the wisdom to know what to do about it and the courage to follow through. And Father, I pray for all of us that as we practice generosity and we purpose to be grateful, I pray that you would meet us there just like you promised you would, that you would get a hold of our heart. God, we don't want to be people who are mastered by our possessions. We don't want to worship money. We don't, we don't want to be consumed with our stuff or what we wish was our stuff. We want to be consumed by you. So help us to put our money where our mouth is. Help us to put our money where we want our heart to be. 
And God, I just pray that you'll have your way in us. I pray that you'll get, be, become more and more involved in all the things in our life, but especially in our finances. And so God, we just invite you. We ask that you'd work for your glory in Jesus' name.